We have some amazing speakers for you guys today. We've got Justin Waldron, the co-founder of Storyverse, Playco, and Zynga. And he's joined by Keone Han, the co-founder and CEO of Monad. So welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having us. Awesome. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, yeah, Justin, if you could start off, if you could kind of share your personal story as well as uh, what you're working on with uh, Storyverse. Sure. So, um, yeah, a quick overview on me. Uh, a lot of people think of me as a game founder because uh, the first company I started was a game company, it was Zynga. It was about uh, 14 years ago at this point. And um, we're well known for pioneering the freemium model for virtual goods and games. So back in 2007, there weren't a lot of games that had microtransactions. Um, it was so sort of primitive at that time that we had to build our own payments processing in-house. We had to use obscure payments uh, services that were only used by adult video sites. We had to build a 40 person fraud team. It was um, it was a huge endeavor to get anything stood up at all. So uh, we were popular for first Zynga Poker and then Mafia Wars and Farmville and um, Yoville, which was like the biggest virtual world in the world at the time. Um, and, and later stuff like Words of Friends, CSR Racing, uh, a lot of different games recently, the company was was sold to take two. But if you look at the original founding team of Zynga, uh, we weren't really games people. So we were very much startup, um, social networking technologists. And I think not a lot has changed from, from that perspective. So what made us different was sort of first principles thinking around how do you take this tech and do something new and interesting with it. And maybe what we didn't know about games let us kind of go and explore a different space that had really not been explored much up until that point. And so for us, it was kind of obvious that games could become something more like a web service because that was where we spent our time previously. Um, but but uh, there weren't many people from games who were thinking that way yet. So what's always interested me is kind of what's next on the business model side for, for games um, or for any other technology. So I've invested in a lot of companies, um, about 100 angel investments, including Substack and, a, and about a, a bunch of creator sort of marketplace type of companies in, in Web3 as well. And um, yeah, now I'm working on a new thing, Storyverse, which is helping people create games and share games uh, using blockchain technology. So the idea is how do you empower a new type of creator to create games individually, leveraging the IP that's out there uh, on, on the blockchain um, to go and produce new value. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Um, Kione, we'd love to hear your personal story as well as uh, what you're working on with Monad. Sure thing, Stephen. Um, just to introduce myself really quickly, my name is Keone Han. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Monad Labs. We're building Monad, a new high-performance EVM layer one, specifically a new blockchain that introduces parallel execution and superscalar pipelining to uh, the Ethereum virtual machine. I guess a bit of background about me. Um, prior to Monad, I worked for about 10 years in the high frequency trading space. Uh, I was a quant, so I was building predictive signals and um, using machine learning to build predictive models for short term price predictions for a number of different, uh, very liquid um, futures and equities and other instruments. Um, did that for about eight years at Jump Trading, uh, joined the crypto team at Jump in mid-2021, and spent a little bit of time um, working, especially in the Solana ecosystem, and um, working, you know, supporting a lot of um, builders who are building really high-performance apps on Solana, um, which was sort of the genesis for Monad, because... Uh, my coworker James and I, who were teammates since 2014, were really excited by what Solana was bringing to the blockchain space. Um, the idea of really high performance, plentiful transactions and really cheap transactions made a lot of sense. But uh, there was also, you know, a lot of shortcomings with Solana and also a strong need for um, really performant EVM. So we left uh, Jump and together with the third co-founder, Yunus, started Monad at the beginning of 2022. Monad is really just uh, optimizing the EVM at all levels. We see um, EVM as being similar to JavaScript in the early 2000s, where it's a dominant standard, but 
um, was really not very optimized. And our whole team's goal is just to optimize at the very low levels and then build a new blockchain that can scale to um, tens or hundreds of millions of users and, and many, many applications. And uh, excited to be here today. Um, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that JavaScript analogy is, is a great analogy. Um, yeah, both of you guys are working on some amazing stuff. Um, cool. So today's topic is titled Founder Market Fit. So maybe let's level set because I'm not sure if everyone has the same definition, uh, including myself. So I'm curious to hear like what how you guys would define founder market fit. Uh, maybe Keone, if you want to start. Sure. So I think when I think about that, I think about the things that uh, the founder or founders need to do. And I guess a couple of things come to mind. It's building the initial product, um, which depending on the size of the project or the timing, that might mean building the whole prototype, or it might mean building a portion of it and then supervising a team, i.e. defining the architecture, tackling the really tricky bits and and managing other people. Um, so building the initial product, raising money, hiring a team, managing that team. Um, and I want to underline that because it means you have to manage people. Like not everyone likes managing. Um, it means being in a lot of meetings. It means being very committed to other people's success, putting them in a position to succeed. Um, okay. Have to manage people, have to actually sell the product, have to market the product and also have to sustain yourself um, before you raise money. And so all of those things are things that founders need to do. Um, and I think defining founder market fit means being confident that you have um, a reasonable set of uh, you know previous experience and expertise to be able to do the parts of that that are really hard, um, which I would specifically focus on like building that initial product and defining the architecture, solving the really tricky bits. Um, knowing that a lot of the other things are, are things that like, are maybe more generic that anyone could do, but you're just going to have to work really hard to do all those other things as well. Yeah. A lot of different hats. <laughs> um, yeah, Justin, we'd love to hear how, how you define founder market fit as well. F founder market fit. So I think it's, um, it really seems to be like a recent thing people have been focused on about how the founder fits with whatever they're working on. And in my experience, I think that founder market fit has to do with identifying opportunities more than solutions. And what I mean by that is your past experience can work against you in terms of uh, sort of jumping to conclusions about how something could be solved. And so what you see a lot of times is like the, the Zynga model, you have a bunch of people from social networking that go figure out the next way games are going to work. And everybody from games thinks it's sacrilegious that we would even try something like this and it's impossible. But we had a deep knowledge about something else that let us sort of explore space that wasn't explored. And I think that's fairly common, even something like Substack. It started by a bunch of people who started mobile messenger company. They really understood social. They really understood those dynamics. They were not from uh, the writing business so much. And so... I think this is like a fairly common uh, way to go about looking at things. I would say that in the early stages, things are tend to be highly technical as well. And um, at least in games from where I've spent a lot of time, it turns into a bit of a media business. And it's not that dissimilar from movies. So if you think about Pixar, the beginnings of the company were about building a new 3D rendering pipeline, new hardware, new software, everything. The end of the company is almost entirely like a Disney. It's all about media. Um, and the technology becomes less and less important over time. We saw the same thing happen at Zynga. So it started off with all technologists. It ends up being, um, you know, DreamWorks on the board and all the typical sort of entertainment suspects because the technology is sort of perfected at some point. I think in, in blockchain gaming, um, there's a tendency right now to maybe overemphasize the abilities of somebody from the media side uh, on the game side. So this is my hot take for you on the founder market fit where if you were working on a AAA game where none of the technology was difficult because you were standing on you know 20 layers of abstraction, you are not necessarily the right person to go figure out how the hell to get uh, some L2 to work and, and make it all a seamless experience uh, when you're building a new game on something as primitive as where we are with, on the blockchain. And so what I like to um, say is like, basically you can identify the problems because you've been in the space and you want to have to go and solve those problems, which is something that if you come from a mature end of the cycle and a lot of these 
spaces like where mobile gaming is now, when you go and make a game, you're not solving technology problems anymore. You're using um, the pieces of the stack that have been developed over the last 10 years. And you're really thinking about how do I bring a game to market? How do, what kind of game do people want? And all of these other things are solved for you. We're sort of in the opposite timing of this right now with, with blockchain, where it's, you're probably going to spend more time solving these problems that are already solved for you on mobile games than you'll solve, than you'll spend on building the actual game. Um, and so that takes a different type of founder and it's acknowledgement of the stage of where we're at and just like what, what people like working on. So, um, cause a lot of those problems are, they're issues that we haven't experienced before. You've got to just dig in and be willing to bang your head against the wall and figure out why something doesn't work. You know, you brought up some examples, like some great examples, like, you know, the, uh, you know, with Zynga or the founders of Substack in terms of like their previous domain experience. Um, so if we could actually like double click on that, if I'm repeating back what, what I'm hearing, um, let me know if you think what I'm repeating back is, is what you're trying to say is experience in terms of founder market fit is industry dependent and dependent on the stage of that industry. So if you're entering a relatively immature industry, such as crypto, your experience in a mature industry may or may not translate. Um, is that, am I hearing that right? Yeah, that's that's one part of it. And the other thing is that we have a tendency to take out um, if, if, you know, if, a, if we have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And you learn a lot of tricks throughout your career. And they tend to work like within a certain window. And this is applied to, to sort of everything it could be marketing product designs change trends change technology, everything is always changing, and it's changing even faster right now. And so there's a there's a tough thing to figure out, like when something is stale versus when it's a best practice. And, and I think that that's something that almost no one can sort of continually get right. I mean, you look at movie companies, it's when they drag out sequels too long, or like the tropes just go for a bit longer than they should. Um, in technology companies, it's like you use the last generation stack and you're de-risking by using the thing that everybody on your team knows how to use, but, but maybe in some basic way, it's, it's going to be against like where everything is headed. These are all the types of um, changes I think we're making all the time. I would just say it's the hardest part is to come in and um, the experience you have is understanding the structure of a market and the problems of it and like what things might be interesting, but like not jumping to solutions. So um, that takes like, it's kind of first principles thinking combined with understanding where things are at and where things often go wrong. And you've seen this a lot in, in Web3 is like, I'm from games. I know what I'm doing. Get out of the way. Like, I'm going to go build this thing, but there's not enough sort of... Um, respect for like how much might be different this time. And, and I think like a lot might be different this time and figuring out what's different and, and what's similar is like a process of trial and error basically. And just being humble about, you know, what's proven and what isn't. You seem yeah. to be suggesting it's a pretty level playing field then in the sense that, you know, like anyone could use first principles thinking and be humble. Is there anything that like, is a you know an edge that you're bringing as a you know from whatever previous experience you have well i mean look the number one games like the game right now i think is pixels right uh that's what i'm hearing recently so over 100k dau luke is fantastic he doesn't have experience in games previously some people in the game do um i think axi infinity i don't think the founders of that were previously at it well i mean there was a little bit of experience in games but but not a ton um so no, I think I think understanding the ins and outs of of this technology will help you understand where some of the opportunity is. Um, there has been the opposite challenge too, of course, where like you've had projects who've committed to building large scale games that haven't done game development before. Um, I, I think it's more of a mindset thing than about experience. And there are a lot of things to learn from game development. There's a lot of ways to waste a lot of time building a game. Um, it's sort of like one of the most <laughs> expensive uh development processes you can go through there's sort of we just look at gta 6 was announced finally after uh, 11 years and people seem pretty happy about the the trailer but i mean it just speaks to how long something can stay in development so you can run in circles forever on game development in a way that seems unique to games um but so there, there's a balance here but i guess my my point is like I, i'm coming from premium and i want to like take the best the best uh practices that i've i've learned but I mean, honestly, um, I think I think there's going to be if it's just to replace the IAPs that we've had for 12 years, that doesn't seem like the likely future to me. There are some benefits to users uh, from that approach. 
But I think usually what ends up happening here is like there's some new use case that's just newly enabled by this model that is a small group of people at first and then grows to a much larger uh, group of people later. And that's that's what's most exciting to me. I think that that's what's likely. And I do think that um, the teams that discover those those pieces will probably not be uh, the people who come in and, and just try to like ship their AAA game on, on you know, a chain. So it, it almost sounds like, you know, Justin, you're kind of coming from the angle of like, you know, first principles, domain experience is not necessarily always needed for in, in certain scenarios, um, you know, um, using citing some of the examples that, that you mentioned. And I'm sure we could all think of examples too, right? It's not like Mark Zuckerberg had, had previous experience either for an industry that didn't exist back then. I want to kind of flip to Keone and get Keone's perspective because he's almost on the other side of that where you obviously have very strong um, technical experience in what you're doing today. And that translates directly into what you're doing with Monad. And maybe that's the reason why you need it because it is a more technical product, but curious to hear your 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 reactions. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested by what Justin had to say. And I, I can definitely, I think it's... Um inspiring to hear that like at the end of the day it is quite a level playing field because for for all of us as entrepreneurs like we are challenging incumbents or disrupting like you know it is good to know that like anything is possible as long as you um you know think very critically about what you're doing um i i would say like the most important thing is going where there's demand so like identifying where there's evidence of demand or if there's not evidence of demand where you think there's latent demand. And if in the latter case, you have to convince other people that there is actually latent demand that's not manifesting yet because, you know, you're creating some new market. Um, so I think that the idea matters a lot. I think that it matters actually more than anything else. Uh, because the idea that you commit to the road you go down ends up being, you know, a huge determiner of the success of the effort, right? Like, you know, if um, for any successful startup, like if they had done something totally different, like the odds of it succeeding are not, you know, a hundred percent the way that it ended up being, um, you know, in hindsight with a thing that they did do. So obviously the idea matters a lot. Um, but yeah, I think that like you could just use first principles thinking to identify where there is uh, demand and also identify like why the existing incumbents are not doing that right now and also why they won't do it between the time when you start doing it and when you're, you know, you ship a product, um, which actually is probably the least dangerous out of them because a lot of incumbents are just committed to their course of action already. Um, and they're too busy, too bogged down with their own problems already to like go into your lane. Um, but the idea matters a lot. And so I would say like from, uh, to the extent that like the founding team needs to match the idea, it is just like the idea that you're building a snowball and you're going to keep growing the snowball, like bigger and bigger every day, um, by like putting in effort and hiring good people that contribute to the effort and making partnerships and um, trading resources that you have for things you don't have, you're going to keep building the snowball, but the snowball needs to start big enough to start where like you can actually, you know, start getting, getting some um, snow packed against it and, gr and grow into something bigger. And so for me, the idea is that the things you need fundamentally are like a founding team that, has the technical knowledge to do the hard things about the hard technical things about the thing you're trying to build. Um, so in our case, we're building a really high performance blockchain. So we needed within our founding team um, expertise of like how to build really performance systems in the past and confidence that we'd be able to replicate that. Now, obviously very different domain. High frequency trading is a different domain from um, from a building a high performance blockchain, but like having had that success in the past to know like, yeah, we probably could probably could build something that is um, cutting edge state of the art in terms of performance. Um, 
that's the one thing. And then the other thing is just like the enough knowledge of the industry to know, like, you know, why the current incumbents haven't done that yet. And the, you know, reasonable confidence to know that, you know, they're not going to all of a sudden like uncover some breakthrough improvement that means the thing that, that we are doing is not needed anymore. Yeah, I find it interesting because you guys are kind of coming from the almost like opposite end of the experience spectrum when kind of talking about this this particular topic. Um, but at the end of the day, it sounds like you guys are almost saying the same thing. You know, Justin mentioned about don't be a hammer looking for a nail, right? Like um, don't be too overly solution focused. And you, know, you just mentioned, you know, like um, looking at the user demand, right? And so it, it sounds like regardless of where you're where you're coming from on the experience scale either way you should still be kind of like you know user focused customer focused right um that's cool let's i want to bring it back up a level a bit and kind of like hear some of your guys' personal stories so this is actually a question from one of our attendees Jamie he submitted this in the last survey uh so the question is could you share a pivotal moment or realization when it really crystallized why you wanted to build in crypto. Um, I guess, Justin, if you don't mind starting with us. Interesting, okay. Um, well, honestly, I think I think this space is, is just a good fit for my own personal interests. Um, and from a very young age, I was, I was programming. Uh, my mom was in IT. I had um, programming books in the free sort of software, Visual Studio, Visual Basic, I'm talking about in the 90s um, on a computer. And at that point, like there wasn't that many interesting things you could make with your own little dialogues in Visual Basic, right? So I spent time hacking AOL. And this is like a big pastime of people who were growing up with a computer and were too young to understand um, you know, the negative effects of what they were doing at that time. So I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, like hacking my favorite video games, reverse engineering, sitting in byte byte code, like literally, um, you know, making ways to to modify these existing online games because they were where I spent my time. It was like Roblox didn't exist yet, but I could make my guy float inside of some online, you know, PlayStation Two game or something. So this was kind of the fun I was having before I I could make uh, my own games, and it was so hard at that time. I remember looking up these things when I was younger, um, like development kits for PlayStation, PlayStation Two, and now. We just take for granted that you you spend ninety nine dollars with iOS and you've got access, right? And um, but there was a time where like I remember twelve, thirteen years old, just looking up, how do I get a PlayStation development kit? And it was like you need to apply, you need to be a company. It was all this stuff. The information wasn't even on the internet. It was it was practically secret. You know, you probably had to send a fax to Sony, um, literally in the nineties. I live in Japan, so I'm sure it was a fax. And um, I think that like I. I, I, I feel like there's just people want to make things. That's that's kind of my takeaway. I, I don't think everybody's willing to go through as much pain as I went through, but but almost everybody wants to make something. And um, what we saw with Zynga was like, we used to call it invest and express. So these games like Farmville, um, there was this canvas that you give people. And if you just give them a blank canvas, they don't know what to do with it. But if, if you give them a simple game to play, then what they can make can be pretty impressive. And at the end of it, you're shocked if you respect like, that all people are creative. You've got 40 million people a day playing and they're doing this simple thing. And at the end of it, they actually make something pretty interesting. Um, and we saw this time and time again in our games. And like, when you let them make that investment, they get really attached because they're not given that many opportunities in their life anymore to actually go and do something creative. And there's this trick of just like kind of getting them to do that slowly where, um, it, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but for a lot of people, this might be one of the only creative hobbies or pastimes they have, right, is, is playing this game where that's the outcome. And I realized that giving people that was a gift. Um, and this whole virtual goods craze was like a good way to do it because it was free. And so we made games more accessible. And you can tell you're pissing off people that um, are the current guard when, when they're angered by what you do. And that was because we were making games free when they weren't free. Um, and that is why so many game companies absolutely hated freemium for such a long time. That is why so many current freemium game companies and other game companies hate what crypto is doing, because if it works, um, it really does, you know, sh flip the apple cart. Like everything is kind of starting over from scratch. But um, I don't know if it's just like a um, <laughs> mischievous uh, tendency in myself, but like it's more fun to flip the apple cart than to ride it. Um, and 
I, I just think this is where all the interesting fun happens. So like, I want to spend time in figuring out what that is next. For crypto, my personal journey was I got involved pretty early. People sent me Bitcoin. They said, this is kind of like Farmville coins. It's not like Farmville coins at all. Um, and and then I um, I was a mentor at the Teal Foundation. So I had a, an email forwarded to me from a young Vitalik um, saying that he was making some smart contract chain thing. And I had no idea what the hell to even make of it. Um, it's I've had a lot of early sort of um, experiences with this stuff. So I was an advisor to, to Dapper to Immutable, um, to Decentraland, all these very, very early projects. And I stepped back and I just said like, look, I'm going to help on the game side. Um, this is really early. I have no idea what the hell is going on here and learn from these teams that are just like, you know, they just dove in heads, heads first. Like Decentraland was the most ambitious thing by far at the time that white paper came out um, within games. And um, yeah, I mean, no matter what you think of it today, when you re remember what year that, that that project started, it was like when that white paper came out, there was there wasn't a single other thing that was that was like that. And so I just try to stay close to people who are doing crazy things like that um, and, you know, try to keep an open mind and learn. And for me, um, the idea that crypto will work comes back to like a basic for, for games, comes back to a, a basic way of thinking about its first principles is like if if you think about crypto as a sort of speculative gambling nature, there already are a lot of ways to gamble and gambling is popular and speculation is popular. That's certainly a use case. And I think we've already seen a lot of that pan out. But if you think about the freemium games market, you've got a um, hundred billion ish spent a year. And those people right now actually get zero dollars back from their purchases. So this is kind of an interesting fact that people always forget, which is they spend a hundred billion dollars and it just goes poof. Um, there is no upside and there is no downside. It's just all gone. And they get some entertainment in return. And this really did not click with people at first. They were like, they couldn't understand it because if you're not in the context, spending a thousand dollars a month on a game seems ridiculous. But if you're in the game, spending a thousand dollars can feel like a great value. And so context is everything. But I think one thing that could happen over time that to me has always been the, the sort of leading indicator of where entertainment goes is sort of cost of entertainment per hour. And so video games have always been the lowest cost form of entertainment per hour. This is something since the console days that um, people have been tracking. So even though you're spending $50 on a game, you may play for 50 hours, you're getting a dollar an hour of entertainment. Freemium brought it down more. Now there's ads and other ways to subsidize it. There's there's IAPs and app purchases. Um, but what crypto can do is make it even cheaper. And that's counterintuitive because people think it's going to make it more expensive. They see the uh, $69 million people and they hear NFTs are going to be in games and they think, I don't want that. I don't want 69 million dollar um, energy packs in my favorite game but what might actually happen is even if we just took this spend that everyone's spending on these games and we just shifted it over this 100 billion went to in-app purchases of actual crypto items that could be resold after you're done using them then now all these people that are spending a thousand dollars a month in games if they don't even think about it from the speculative standpoint like going and making money they could get 900 dollars back um, and this is something that if you if you follow the trend of games, like people are not stupid, right? They watch their month, their monthly budget. Even people who spend a thousand dollars a month in games, they pay attention to how much it costs them to, to do these things. And so, when they start getting this opportunity, um, ignoring all the gains just to get some of their money back when they're done playing a game, they will start to ask why the other games aren't giving it to them. And so, if nothing else, like there's a long term economic force here that I think is going to make this quite inevitable. You've got to get enough games going where they can do that. And there's there's real risks that the publishers are taking in the meantime, where if everything is a primary sale right now, if you're selling $2 billion worth of items a year and you start along for the secondary, that's money that the publisher is not making anymore. And this is why a lot of game companies have had mixed feelings on this, especially once royalties have become more at risk. Um, but from a player standpoint, it's a clear win. And so I think a lot of the tokenomics around growth will fuel a lot of the early successes. But I think at like some sort of um, state that we eventually get to, it probably just becomes about like, this is a more fair way that's more like the real world. You buy a pair of skis, you go skiing for three seasons, you sell the pair of skis, you buy a guitar, you play for three years, you sell it back, you buy a new guitar. This is the, what we expect of, of property. And it's actually kind of strange that virtual property doesn't work this way. Um, and once it does, it's just a better deal for everybody who's who's already spending the money. So I think... That's just a law of gravity that's that's going to play out eventually, but it could take a while. Oh man, there are so many good nuggets in there. Um, I, I just want to do a quick follow-on question to that is, you know, it, 
it does seem like you kind of have a couple themes in your career. Like you kind of mentioned, you know, like business model of games um, and kind of like making, making it more accessible to more people. It does seem like there's like a kind of a thread of a common theme throughout your different ventures. Like, was that kind of like your master plan or was it just something like in, in retrospect, you see the thread, but at the, at the time when you're building, you didn't actually notice it. I'm just kind of curious to hear your, you know, what you're I know. I think it's just, I, I mean, it's what's interesting to me. Um, I, I think what's interesting to me is like, if you make new technology that connects people in new ways, it's a pretty good place to spend your time. Like a one way to step back and, and just look at like the biggest tech companies in the last 15 years is what helps people connect in new ways. You know, Facebook is a social network. We can call it a social network, but Airbnb is also a way that helps people connect in new ways, right? These companies tend to be w ways for people to connect in, in new and in interesting ways. Even Stripe, a payments company, is really a way for people to connect in another way. Um, and I think if you if you stay focused on the person and what they need to do and how they connect with the people that they care about or businesses that they could care about, then that's a pretty good place to spend your time. Um, and if you spend time on things that are the most interesting, then I, I just think like it increases your surface area of luck, right? You learn about something, it doesn't always pan out, but, um, and I, I certainly like in crypto, there's been huge differences in timing, right? You're like five, six years too early for, to build some of these ideas, but, um, you know, the time will, will come if the momentum is there. And I feel like it usually are, it, it's the same, sus it's always the same suspects. Um, I, I think if you spend enough time in the space, you keep bumping into the same people, in the same places playing with the same things. Um, they tend to be kind of like, you know, just exploring the stuff and going down the rabbit hole. So I mean, definitely no plan on my side. We didn't plan to start a game company, right? We we followed our our curiosity on, on that side. So like we said, let's put out a poker game. You know, college kids love poker. In 2007, it was a big deal. And you put out a poker game and you realize this is like really interesting. Let's do blackjack because blackjack is adjacent to poker. Okay, blackjack's not quite as big as poker, but it sort of worked. What about board games? People love board games. Then before you know it, you're building a farming simulation game, right? So um, I, I think like it's it's just looking at what's in front of you, looking at what could be next, looking at like what it means, evaluating it honestly, killing bad ideas, moving on. This is like a really important thing I learned because in a game company, you you work on a lot of things you don't you don't use. So um, good game companies kill a lot of ideas, and um, yeah, just finding making sure you're on something interesting. Love that. Following your interests. Um, I'm just waiting for Farmville on Monad. So let's 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 shift over to, to Kyote. Um uh, same question, kind of like um, you know, for you, like why Mon why Monad, kind of why that connection, what what spoke to you about about that idea? You mentioned ideas a couple of times earlier. So if you can kind mm -hmm. of walk us through your thought process there. Yeah. So I guess two things I want to mention. The first one, why Monad? Um so you know, honestly, the the state of the art is still very, very slow, very, very expensive. Um, we need a better base layer. Um, typically, the plan of building a better mousetrap is not a good idea, or like they warn you against doing that. But on the other hand, like, you know, um, uh, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of the... Um, before Facebook, what was it? I'm thinking of Zanga, which is wrong. Um, MySpace. Tom, My, MySpace. MySpace. Okay. For some reason, I have in my head the MySpace, whatever. Um, you know, MySpace existed and then Facebook came along. So there's still, like, when you see something that isn't very good and you have a vision for something better, um, it's still very possible to go and, and do that. Um, and specifically in the context of EVM, like EVM. Ethereum right now is 10 transactions per second. Like that's nothing compared to the, you know, the number of people on earth. And like, if all of them are trying to push their transactions through one world computer, it's not going to work. So it's just a mix of like common sense. And then um, knowing what it would entail to actually solve that problem. Um, like having a good, like kind of map of what needs to get done, where the bottlenecks are, um, what, things, you know, how big of a team we need to build to do that, what things are going to be the tricky parts, and then um, going after it and, and working quickly. Um, so that's sort of the first thought I have. The other thought I have about, you know, more about like seeing the the why and why building crypto, um, I am kind of reminded of the, the days of uh, AOL and Instant Messenger, because um, 
there was a period, um, I was maybe a little too young. I'm 34. I think, uh, like aim was really popping off, like in the like mid nineties, um, before there was kind of a backlash, but there was a period of time where you could just go on aim and like join chat rooms and like meet people on the internet, like make friends with people. Um, and then like, then there's a backlash. So then everyone stopped using instant messengers. They become, became much more about like talking to people that you already knew. Um, but the cool thing about crypto, I feel is that there people are literally just going on the internet and like making friends with strangers and building their communities. Um, that's something that's really special, like something very unique. So I completely agree with Justin about how there's like, whenever you see like, technology bringing people together that is that there's actually a ton of value there and i guess specifically in the context of crypto part of it is like um you know decentralizing currency like when you see dogecoin and you see how like valuable dogecoin is as a currency and it's all just based on memes it's all based on the idea of like you know we all just attribute value to this thing um you realize that like a lot of the other things that we attribute value to like gold or diamonds, et cetera, those are also just memes as well. So I think there's a little bit of an element of like people realizing that if they all come together and like value something collectively together, that thing can actually have value and perhaps more value than the things that we used to value that were very centralized in production and centralized in terms of control. Um, so I think from a, um, similar, I was similar to Justin, like the, um, the rebel, it's like you are, you are contributing to like a rebellion that's happening against centralized systems. So I think that that's also very exciting and it's all tied together by this thread of community and the idea of people who don't know each other, like becoming friends and forming a community through, uh, whether it's just like their interactions online or like membership in NF ownership of NFTs or things like that reminds me of the ASL days. Um, yeah, your, your point about, you know, like value, whether it's, you know, Dogecoin or gold. Um, yeah, that could be, yeah, that would be like such a fun conversation all in itself. Um, I, I want to kind of switch gears to kind of something a little bit more tactical for the audience that are builders and founders. So um, I think it's, there's like a two part question. So one is, what can you do? What actions can you take as a founder to develop a founder market fit? And then two is like, how do you know when you've gotten it? Like what kind of signals or metrics or KPIs or other types of indicators uh, are you looking for? So kind of actions and indicators. Um, uh, maybe Kiona, do you want to t take a first crack? Sure. Um well, I know I, I just keep going back to the the basics, but it's like for me, it would be knowing the difference between things that you need to have going in because they might be hard to develop and knowing what things you'll just figure out over time. Um, I mean, yeah, and I'm sure also like, uh, you know, be like Justin, for you being a multi-time founder, like you've already like been through a lot of shit. So you've already... Um, you know, kind of instinctively or directly from experience, like what things you don't have to worry about because you'll figure them out later versus what things you have to have nailed down from the start. But for a lot of first time founders, it, it must be like, it, really, it just seems like it's really important to like define the things that you absolutely have to be good at already for that particular problem. And then also know that with most other things, like you'll just you'll just figure it out. Like you'll just get better. Like I remember when, um, we started Monad, like I was really bad at public speaking. Um, and I, but I think part of me knew like that I would get better over time. Like obviously just something you get better at with practice and, you know, you don't have to be good at fundraising. You don't have to have an existing network, although it does help. Um, but you know, as long as you have a couple people that, you know, you can rely on and it can help you grow your network and you, put effort into networking, like the network part doesn't really matter that much. Um, but it, I think the two things are really like the technical part. So having enough coverage to, 
um, like architect the thing that needs to get done and hire people that are really high caliber that can contribute to that effort. That's number one. And then number two is just knowing the, knowing the market well enough to know that there's demand there and that um, you can, you can grow that market if there's not enough demand just yet. I mean, that takes a lot of like self-awareness, right. To kind of, to kind of know what you don't know and kind of like, Oh, these are the things that I need to hire or partner or whereas like, Oh, these are the other things that I, I could develop on my own, like public speaking in, in, in your case. Um, right. The- but you can't really change. I, I think it's also just like, almost like resignation. Like you could say at, at a given moment, like, ah, crap, like I'm not good at public speaking, but that's okay. Like it's not the other way around where you're, you're like, you think that you're good at something, but it turns out you're actually bad at it. Or I, I don't know. I just think it, you don't really have a choice, but at least you know that that's something that doesn't matter as much. But the, the, the being able to hire actually is quite important because I think um, it's like hard to hire people that are, are really like experts in what they like to if say that you were like not that strong technically, but then you were trying to hire a technical expert, it might be really hard to hire that person mm-hmm. if you don't have like, if the there's a huge disparity in the level of technical expertise. So I think the founding team kind of needs to be like balanced enough where there's someone who has that, that level of expertise where like they could hire people that are also like very much experts, if expertise is what you need for the thing that you're building. Makes a ton of sense. Um... Yeah. Um, ha- handing over to Justin, curious to hear your take, you know, what kind of like action should founders take to to develop the founder market fit and, and what kind of indicators should they look for to know if they have it? Um, yeah. So I feel like what often happens with a technical founder early in a space like this is, is you are your own customer to some extent. You built something because you saw the opportunity, you wanted it. Um, and I think that that's really helpful early on. I think taking that and then understanding who the other customers are is really important. And the reason is because it tells you like who's or and what is high leverage to do and what's not. And I think people don't spend enough time figuring out who their customer is. It's like one of the most common failure states. And it doesn't matter how technical your business is. You have a customer. You always have a customer. And if you're not sure who your customer is, um, you probably haven't thought about it hard enough. And I think when if you don't know who they are, you don't know what you're selling them. And that's kind of step two, right? You have to understand what, what they want. And for me, like what's been really helpful in this space is it's so easy to just get on the phone with somebody and just brainstorm externally instead of internally. So like, just ask people, what if this thing existed? Like, would you want that? But um, asking them in a way of getting real feedback is, is hard, right? Because generally people are very supportive in this space and they're positive um, and they want to say nice things. So to me, it's like, how do you filter out false positives, right? Like, how do you go ask people for an LOI? How do you go ask people to like put skin in the game when they start having to say yes, because they actually want it and not um, just say, wow, that's a great idea. Yeah, let me know when something is ready. Um, And I I think that if you can find a way to do that, we used to call this um, in in social games because they were web-based way before Apple started putting more rules in the app store. We used to just put out features that weren't real. So like we would put a, a feature on poker and we didn't ship it, but we wanted to know if people wanted it. So we would just put a button there and it would say it would do something and kind of describe the feature, see how many people clicked it. No one wanted it. We don't build it. Um, that type of thing. Like you can do that with people today, um, directly, especially in web three where people are always communicating with each other. And I think it's a much faster and cheaper way of validating some of these ideas, um, than going and building everything. Like you don't need to build most things to, to validate most things to some extent. And you'll learn a lot by talking to a lot of people and not just like mentors or people who are smarter than you. You, you learn a lot by talking to customers. And so um, I I think that that's what I've been learning a lot about um, in this space, but it's tricky. This space is really tricky because, <laughs> because people are playing a game of thinking or deciding what people want based on what they think other people want. And this is like a little bit different than when you start doing a typical consumer product, you just ask someone like, would you use this? You put it in front of them, you watch how they use it, you see where they get confused and you fix it. Um, What often happens in crypto is there's some set of people who are playing a different game, which is, do I think other people would want this? And their framework for thinking about how um, other people would want it is often flawed. 
And it's based on sort of like reinforcement around what's made them win in the market, which is often very divorced from, from what actually works with people doing what they want. Um, and so we like to say that markets are always right. To some extent, I'll say in crypto, like it's just evidence that this isn't true. Like the vast majority of things in this space do not have product market fit and the values are all over the place. So um, the sort of proof is in the pudding that like that is bullshit. Like basically most products in this space are worth zero, yet somehow the tokens are flying all over the place. And what I'll say about that is like, the, the hard part is getting real feedback in a space where people are actually playing that game all the time and getting positively reinforced that they're right, even though they don't have any evidence that what they think they're right about is, is correct yet. And so um, I'll give you a good example, like land sales, you know, just so there's more hot takes in this conversation. Land sales last year, by far the biggest revenue generator for NFT projects. Um, in every case, I think it's going to be challenging for the projects that made a lot of that revenue to come back. And it's more reliability than anything else now. So I, I think it what ended up being sort of like the one of the metas around these game projects is now something that's um, a huge burden. Like if you did one and you made tens of millions of dollars, congrats, you've got the cash in your balance sheet. But you've got a really, really difficult needle to thread when it comes to giving value to the people you promised it to while also somehow getting a bunch of people to play because it can't just be the landholders, right? And I think people had not thought through that meta enough, but the market was certain that that was a thing. And so people gave them what the market wanted. And so you have to recognize like if those people are your customers, those people were essentially like quasi investors, right? They were not the customer of the product. And those quasi investors, depending on your tokenomics, now hold your game hostage from actually going and serving real customers. But there's got to be real customers at the end of the day for any of this stuff to keep moving. So what I would say is like, don't get caught up in the memes that only satisfy sort of like our hyper local community of traders and DGENs. Um, I love them. And I think if you find a way to include them in the, in the broader group, then that's by far the best outcome. Like they can propel you to new heights. They'll be the best advocates you could possibly have. But there are a lot of narratives that they're stuck on that um, are not compatible with, with normal users. And so the trick is sort of finding the intersection of the two. Um, and I mean, overall, like if, one thing I really liked, and I, I think I heard this from like a really early Facebook founder. It wasn't Zuck, it was, it was somebody else. But um, this idea of actions per minute, like if you look at StarCraft players, basically the more actions per minute they do, generally the better player they are. And it's it's like really that simple, the correlation, and they're just all over the keyboard, right? Um, and I like to think that startups are a lot like that. And quick decision-making, um, actions per minute, high leverage actions per minute is important, but they have to be actions you can learn from. So what people often get wrong in this loop is like doing a lot of actions that they don't learn anything from because they haven't instrumented analytics properly. They're not getting the feedback loop of actually learning what happened from the action. And this is one of the really tricky parts before you have some um, traction because everything is a false negative before you have traction. No matter what you, you build, um, if there pe aren't people using it, you can't get the feedback loop or the data about how well it worked because there aren't enough people using your product to statistically know whether or not that thing was a good idea or not. Um, so that sort of, you know, in order of priority, get enough people using your thing that you get statistically significant data about the changes you want to make. Number two is make sure you make as many changes as fast as possible. They're high leverage where you are sure that you're measuring it in a way where you think it is a positive indicator. Number three is just do as many of those as possible and don't do things you can't um, measure. And if, unless you're absolutely certain that there's another way to tell that it was a good idea. And if you can be rigorous about that, then it's just build a learning machine, right? I think that that's the main thing. Some great advice. Um, I love the stories of the fake features in Zynga. I think I actually kind of remember that, like clicking on stuff and wondering what was going on. Um, I'm definitely dating myself. Um, cool, so we're getting a bit on time. So I, would, I do want to jump into the questions. Uh, guys, if you have more questions, now's your last chance to ask them. Um, but yeah, let's start with some questions. So Jamie, if you want to come on stage and ask your question live. Luke, you might need to give Jamie the ability to speak. Yep. One second. Done. Awesome. Hey guys, thanks for uh, all the answers so far and the insights. It's been absolutely insane. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. 
So yeah, the question I had was, you know, just around showing some insight on how successful founders, you know, move beyond identifying this problem to truly understanding it. I think we can all sort of say, okay, I see this problem, but how then do you, you know, use this critical thinking to really dive into it, to show that you understand it. And then I suppose the second part to this is how do you align that with your why, you know, and you as an individual and your founders fit, how do you get that problem and then bring it all together into this narrative that you believe you know, not only can you have you identified the problem, but you're the one to be able to solve this. Whoever wants to take it, just jump in. Yeah. Either or. Um, I guess my, yeah, my, maybe uh, Justin has some better insights, but I guess from my perspective, it's, it's like, there's always these narratives going on in crypto and you can't really just build for the narrative because the narrative will end up changing. So the better thing is to build the thing that you, you believe in, like the thing that you think should exist. And then definitely like try to iterate as fast as you can, um, to get the product out there, get people using it and get their feedback. But I think that in crypto, the space is, still quite um quite friendly like there's um it generally like it's a much more collaborative space than the web 2 space like you see direct competitors um breaking bread and actually like trying to find ways to collaborate it's the, the default is actually collaboration so like seeing the narrative shift more toward you seeing traction on collaboration seeing traction in terms of users i think would be the point at which I would be confident that the snowball is growing and that, um, you know, like the team is gaining, um, operational leverage to keep growing that snowball and is going in the right direction. Um, but I'm also cautious that that somewhat contradicts what Justin was saying earlier, because there's a lot of false positives. So I, I don't know. I'm curious to see if he thinks that that's wrong or if, it just seems to me like, I mean, yeah, like try to, I think the token price, like things like that, those are very distracting. Um, there's always a way to like incentivize usage. And so I think it's like very important to not get high on your own supply and not like overreact to um, metrics that are biased by um, like, you know, either if you're, you're like a, you're a DEX and, you know, there's an incentive, there's a volume incentive for people to trade. And then you see a lot of volume, like you can't be that excited. You have to measure the right thing. You have to measure like the real, um, like the, the traders who aren't getting incentivized or like, you really have to define what you're trying to measure before you start the experiment that way you don't get too excited. Or if you're a protocol that's pre-token where people are anticipating that they might, you know, get some sort of reward for like participating that if you see a lot of participation it is dangerous to like um conclude too much from that but on the other hand the the usage like the momentum is a good way to like get some more wind in your sails and go faster and um so i think it's it's just a delicate mix of like you know allowing the snowball to grow taking advantage of all of the um sort of favorable trends of crypto and the wind being in your sales from some of this momentum, but then also being grounded about like, you know, knowing where the, like where you're actually solving a problem where you're actually giving people something that they would pay to use, even if they were unincentivized. And I guess running experiments with, to see like whether that is actually true. Um, but doing that strategically while also balancing that with just the, incredible growth that's possible in this space. I love your point about, um, we would call it in games like intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic, which is we have these tools to motivate people to do things in this space that are very powerful. And they're probably one of the best reasons to be doing something in this space. Like if you're not doing that, you're probably um, playing with both arms tied behind your back, but you can also do that so much that there's like nothing there. Right. And we, we see a lot of that. And, um, I remember after after Zynga IPO'd, there was this period where gamification 
became like the hottest thing. And everybody became an expert on gamification overnight. And because there were badge systems and achievement systems and XP and all this other stuff in these games that were now part of everybody's life, people said that those would become a part of every product. And yet here we are like 12 years later and it didn't happen. There were books written on this. It was like a really, really big deal. Zynga figured out that everyone's an idiot. And as long as you give them XP, they'll keep using everything. And that just wasn't the case. And uh, we spent a lot of time internally thinking about like, why, why do people play this? Like the psychological motivators around why people play it. They play it to spend time with their family. And all of these other things are just a layer of like motivation for people that keeps them kind of going along that path. But all of them are incredibly ineffective relative to building something that actually fires on these core basic needs in people. Um, and so I would say like that that's such an important point. Um, we we have to figure out how to build things that people want beyond wanting the token. Um, and if part of the token games create a new way for them to get things they want, that's fantastic. Like if you look at social media, likes and comments, people work for their likes. Um, but there's also something more intrinsic they're getting out of it. The likes are sort of a path to getting them to pay attention to this social validation. That's a much, much stronger um, need that's that's being filled. And so I think you can't lose track of, of what's underneath. It is really easy to happen in this space. Um, and I, I think that that's like the, the biggest takeaway I would have when it comes to solving the problem. You have to understand what the real users are. And this is actually really hard because... In, in Web3, there are um, a lot of the typical engagement metrics that we would use for consumer and enterprise, like they don't quite work. And even across a lot of these protocols, um, like where do you use TVL? Where do you use volume? Where do you use? I, I think it's it can be a little bit tricky. Um, I think a lot of people are wondering about engagement on these NFT collections. Like if, if someone holds a ton of these and they, they never log in and they never hit the website, you know, how, how do you think about that in terms of, of um business metrics. Um, my, my sense is like, there are a lot of different ways to succeed, but you better know what your number is and why, because it's related to your future plans, right? So like, if you have plans to build um, more features on your website, but no one goes to your website, well, then you have a problem, right? Um, it doesn't matter how many people are trading your NFTs. If no one's going to your website and your roadmap is to build things on your website, you have to get people paying attention to using your website, right? So it's like really pragmatic, basic stuff like that, where um, I like to think of it as a Fermi equation. So for those of you who haven't heard of those, it's like simple ways to estimate numbers, right? So you can think about, this is like Google interview questions, you know, how many piano tuners are there in, in a city or something? You have to think about like how many people might have pianos in the city, what's the population of the city and like um, how many tuner, or how many people kind of a tuner service in a city and you try to like get to a rough number. These are very useful and people don't, don't do them enough. Um, it's back to that idea of like, how do you validate or invalidate an idea? Okay, so Fermi equations and product. We have a thousand people that hit our homepage every every day. Um, if we put a button in this part of the area, usually these buttons get like 10 to 20% of people will click them. Okay, that's 100 to 200 people are going to click that button. Then we have some flow we're taking them through. Each step of the flow has drop off. Okay, net of it is like 30 people are going to do the thing that we're, we're um, suggesting. That thing has like this amount of re revenue or this amount of sort of K factor social growth associated with it. Like very quickly, you can take an idea, put it on a whiteboard, understand what the impact might be. Now go and make a spreadsheet of which of those are highest leverage. Now take that impact and divide it by the amount of engineering days it costs you. And then you get uh, basically like a list of what are the highest leverage things you can be working on. Now, if you do this really well, you're gonna have a bunch of people on your team that tell you, this is crazy. We're always doing the cheapest, things we can get out next day to drive numbers. Um, and you then have to figure out a way to balance it and like work on some longer term projects too. However, um, if you do this really well, usually you're growing. And once you're growing, then you have the space to go and work on those longer term initiatives. And a lot of people get stuck in working on the longer term initiatives while never doing all this aggressive day-to-day -day blocking and tackling that's required to get anybody to care. Um, so in my experience, like more people in Web3 are thinking about what's a year from now than are thinking about what's tomorrow. And there are examples of other people in the space that are just are focused on the short term. But usually a lot of smart short term decisions actually sometimes is the best way, the best strategy to get to a long term outcome. And so but um, even though we don't often think this way, so that would be the other thing I would focus on.
Yeah, I love how like, you know, I think both of you guys kind of described it maybe differently, but there is kind of like a common thread where, you know, like Justin, you talked about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations. And Keone talked about focusing on the right users. And it's really kind of the same thing at the end of the day. So uh, I love that commonality there. I know we're past time, um, but it looks like no one has really dropped off since we went off. So if we could just do like a quick speed round, like one minute response to this last question here um i don't want to butcher your name um from um abi tej from filaments i apologize for for butchering your name if you want to come up and ask a question real quickly we'll just do a quick one minute response and then we'll wrap things up here um hey um and so my question is like as as you proceed and your understanding of the space proceeds. Uh, so does the uh, transition of the founder market fit as well. So how do you assess um, a pivot and how essential the pivot acts in that uh, product market fit or sorry, a founder market fit? Are you So are you talking about like if you find that you need to pivot, like how should you feel about the new idea fit versus the old one for you? Yeah, and, and 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 how do you assess that? Like, how do you um, pivot from your previous idea to um, the new one? And sort of like, as this, there's a lot of false positives, but if you have initiated with idea, you have started a company and you have some users, but you sort of like have to evolve. Um, how do you now assess based on the founder or team's understanding and um, ensure that there is easier transition and what all aspects you need to sort of account for. Um, so I have a pretty strong feeling about pivots, which maybe might be wrong or invalidated by Justin, but I think that pivots are really like, it's a very extreme action because you're basically like starting over from scratch. Um, and I think that, you know, even forget about the pivot for a second, like say you were going to start a startup, you have to have very strong conviction that that thing that you want to do is the right thing, because you're going to realistically spend like five to 10 years of your life doing that thing. And also the importance of the idea is probably a bigger factor in success than anything else. So like the idea matters a lot. Therefore, like before starting any startup, you have to have, I think, a burning desire to start that thing. Um, it has to be like, you know, the opportunity cost of me not doing that thing is so high that I will like, you know, burn up. I'll like turn into gas right now. Um, so I think that because of that, it means that anything that you start, you really have to be very convinced on the idea. Um, and therefore any pivot I think of as like a new startup. And therefore you have, when embarking on that new startup, you have to be like, oh my gosh, I really need to do this, this new thing. So I guess I, I know that that's like, maybe not that helpful if you're in the situation where you're like going down a path and then you realize it's the wrong one. But I would just say like, invest a lot of time into figuring out what the thing that you should be doing is so that there's not like, you're not on the fence about whether you should pivot or shouldn't pivot. Cause if you're on the fence, then to me, that means that the new idea is also not like the idea that you're burning up to try to, that you can't not do. Yeah. A good pivot isn't running away from a problem. It's running toward one. Um, and, and I think that uh, basically like if you look at the history of great pivots and there's been a lot, um, I mean, you know, discord is a pivot. Uh, Slack is a pivot. There's, there's a very long list of $10 billion plus companies where they were originally something completely different. And I think usually what happens is like a team realizes, wow, we just solved some other half of some other problem very effectively. We better go do that thing that that if we take the half that we solved and, and apply it to this this other opportunity, there's a much bigger opportunity than than what we're working on right now. And you're getting pulled into the problem. And this is just something that's not specific to pivots, which I think gets back to Keone's point about um, like what idea you should be working on in the first place and how important that is and whether the market is pulling the idea out of you or you're sort of forcing your idea into the market. Um, and it's, it's really hard to get right. Uh, to be honest, like everyone's, if you do it a few times, you're going to be having varying levels of this. No one gets it right every time. Um, but my, my take is like, 
pivots are a lot like a court dev exercise. So if you've been through that, you're thinking about um, what are our assets and, and, you know, this is like our code, right? Like, and our people and our users and what can they be used for that they're not being used for right now? And um, what do we know that other people don't know? And is there some way to like use what we've built here to a much more productive end? And I think that this is actually something you should be reevaluating uh, fairly regularly. So it's not a lack of, I like to commit to like a, like a fairly specific s- space, but not like one, one go to market within that space. And so what we've been working on Storyverse is like a pretty good example of that. Basically we said, Hey, there's all these people that say they want to build games in this space. None of them really have the teams to do it. This is like a year and a half ago. Um, and there's all this interesting IP popping up and they're all saying they're putting a game on the roadmap, but none of them are actually building anything. That's interesting. Um, and then we were thinking like, well, there's all this, also these interesting ways of passing around value. So we said, like, let's go figure out a way to just see if we can enable get the first step of enabling that value. And then we tried a lot of different ways. Um, we, we knew IP licensing was part of it, but we tried a lot of different ways to bring that value out to people. And, um, you know, now I think we're, we're like, we've kind of honed in on something that comes out in a month. That's, that's uh, we're, we're feeling pretty good about, but like, we've, we've stayed very committed to this idea that like game engines and creation are going to go from teams to individuals. Um, and that like a lot of this is about how just content is discovered. And so we have like principles that we've, we've been very committed to, whereas the go-to-market has actually changed a lot as we've, as we've learned. And so um, I wouldn't like, it's a, it's a, this is the hardest balance to get right. I mean, in games, we do this all the time. You work on something for three months or you work on it for like three years and then you can it. Um, and you don't want to spend that $30 million of marketing on, on something that you, everyone believes isn't going to work. And you have the team who's been working on it for three years and you tell them, no, we're not going to do it. But then you have your finance team who's like, if we spend $30 million on this and it's not going to work, then, you know, that's an enormous waste of money. So it's, it's such a hard thing um, to, to do, but I will say that like people, opportunity cost is huge right now. We are in this moment with crypto. And AI, if your idea is not big enough, go work on something else. This is this is going to be the best vintage for technology companies in the last 15 years. This is 07, 08, 09. If you wonder why, when you look back at like the first class of YC and half of them are now like the luminaries of their field, it is timing. They were the smart people working on things when there were so many opportunities that it was hard to miss. Um, you had Sam Altman in the first class. You had Alexis Ohani and you had... Like, it's just a ridiculous list of people that the Carlson brothers were in the room. I mean, it, it's just, it doesn't even make any sense. Um, and it's not because like Paul Graham was absolute magic. It was just, there weren't that many people. There was a ton of opportunity. And those few years where like web two was, was built and now web three is being built and AI and crypto like are the thing that levels the playing field. And so I'm going to take, although you should be careful and you should be committed if you are not working on the right thing this year, you will you will regret it. Like this is the year. This is the year where a lot of this happens in my in my take. Um, and you know you should figure out what you have, what you've learned, what you what you can do with your team. That is the biggest opportunity. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a great one to kind of to 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 leave to leave at. Um, I apologize. We we did go over, but uh, it, you know it doesn't look like anyone dropped off. So it seems like people definitely wanted to hear hear the responses. Again, like thank you guys so much, Justin Keone. Um, man, so many gems out of that. Like it's our video editor is going to have a really hard time. He's going to be really busy, <laughs> uh, but it was fun. Learned a lot from you guys. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Any any last words from from you guys that you want to share? No, uh, th- thanks. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I mean, the most fun part about this is like, we're all we're all learning. So we'll have something out shortly and everybody can uh, send very direct feedback to me. Like the, 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 <laughs> the more negative the feedback or the more direct the feedback, the better we learn from it. So i um, looking forward to getting in front of everybody. Awesome. We'll be sure to share that. Yeah, I think my only advice is just to take advantage of the fact that we're a very collaborative space and ask people for advice, um, get opinions. You have to decide ultimately, but you know, there are some unique things about crypto and take advantage of that. Go fast, uh, make, you know, make every day count. 
Awesome. Great, great parting words of advice. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Kione. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending.